Okay, this is the third lecture in this um, class or set of videos focused on creating a sustainable global civilization based on Greek spiritual humanism, Indonesia's Panchasila, um, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So this one is about Aristotle's political virtues. Previous one was his social and personal virtues. These are his political and intellectual virtues, and then wisdom, how they all fit together. All right, so um, Aristotle's works, uh, the ethics, has more distinctions than all the ones that I list, but I think these are the main ones. These are the ones that a person could keep in mind at all times. Some of the other ones they also could, but I'm trying to make it workable. I'm trying to make it sort of intuitively obvious so that once you internalize the set of categories, you actually could carry them with you. You can understand, oh, so I made that mistake because I just didn't get the timing right, right? I got the right thing for the right reason, but it wasn't quite the right way because it wasn't the right time. And we do think about these things, at least I assume you do. And people end up deliberating with each other, saying, well, you didn't have to hurt their feelings about it, or you know, all these distinctions that we make. I want you to realize Aristotle's language, even though it seems pretty foreboding sometimes, the student notes and all that, it's really common sense systematized. So it's what we actually do, but if you systematize it, you could actually do it better. And Aristotle says that at the beginning of his ethics. He says, ethics is good for young people who have been habituated well, and then they can very much take advantage of understanding the patterns behind what it is they've been doing. And then they can uh, internalize that and sort of be more proactive about it. When they were younger, their parents had things in mind. They learned it. At a certain point, they become aware of what their parents must have been thinking or their parents' worldview that would have led them to being raised that way. And then they can uh, have the worldview in their head and use that as their motive for making decisions. It's not because my parents said so. Um, the other thing is that you have to analyze your parents. What were they good at? What were they bad at? Did they give us a good diet? Did they um, have a bad diet because they didn't have the money? Or did they just not have the knowledge? We do this. This is, I think people typically do this kind of thing, but you can do it systematically. Were my parents good at being angry for the right reason in the right way? Or were they too violent and they made their kids kind of overreact? and become sort of immune to punishment because they got yelled at too much. Or they get yelled at, they go yell at somebody else. I mean, all this sort of stuff. So, so by, the time, by the end of this lecture, there will be the basic framework in place that then we use in our daily lives and why that's important. It, it is relevant at every step of the way. So, um, so here's the political virtues. Are the activities regulated by the laws or the activity of making the laws? There are social networks between people who don't know each other personally or have any contact. All right, they just live together under a common body of laws. And it really requires mental thinking to envision yourself as living together under a common body of laws. Now, again, animals 
live together under common habits, customs. They might even be able to anticipate. There's lots of things they can do, but they're not self-consciously living together under a body of laws. They don't make laws that they write down in, you know, on stone or in manuscripts or whatever. And this isn't to say that therefore we're justified in exploiting animals or Aristotle says this capacity we have makes us more virtuous or more wicked than any other animal could be. And we are. Like we're capable of evil that animals are not capable of. We're also capable about evil in the name of good. I mean, we can get things really messed up. And so why would he call us the rational animal is because we have to learn almost everything. <laughs> and so that gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of creativity. We create a realm of human culture, but it also gives us a huge opportunity to be self-destructive, to destroy the natural, to foul our own nest. We do all sorts of stuff that animals uh, don't do because they would not survive if they did it. But we somehow have managed to survive, even though it can be very misguided, perverted. Um, all right. So the political virtues are the ones regu regulated by the laws. Um, okay, the main ones are taking pleasure in living moderately knowing how to make laws that promote a middle class. And these laws include how to distribute social goods. Social goods are the goods that societies define, like status is a social good. Um, uh, education is a social good, formal education. Um, community parks are a social good, okay. The punishment also, knowing how to punish people who break the laws, and you know how to do it in a way that always leads to flourishing, knowing how to apply the laws, knowing when to have mercy, knowing how to enforce the laws. There are people who are really good at being able to talk about and think about these issues, even if they don't actually have the power to do these things. And that's helpful because we can learn from them. Aristotle said older people often have a lot of wisdom about this because they have experience, but they don't necessarily anymore have the authority. It's just that you can learn from them because, and the, the issue here is that on this ancient tradition, you're supposed to learn patterns, pattern recognition. So in the tragedies and the myths, people behave or gods behave in a certain way and you're supposed to say, oh, there's a pattern and it's kind of like my neighbor or whatever. And so this ability to make analogies, similarity and difference. So that's where older people who are good at that can say, oh, the situation that the middle class people, middle age people are in right now, that reminds me of where we were 30 years ago. Now, if they're good at it, that can provide insight. If they're bad at it, or if they don't even, they say, oh, it's all different, it's totally different. Then, you know, nobody can learn anything. It's not going to be totally different, but it's not going to be entirely the same. And so there are people who are better at seeing the analogies and raising the red flags or raising the white flags or uh, whatever, uh, passing down wisdom from one generation to the next in a way that goes beyond just like follow the golden rule or something like that, something that's way too general. So there are people who have a gift for that. There are also a lot of people who claim to have a gift for that. And people disagree about who is actually passing down the wisdom that we need. Um, okay. So in the art of legislation, laws that will weave together the rich and the poor. So we have, you know, we debate about this all the time. Our tax laws, 
our uh, economic sector laws, how much to allow the economic sector a lot of freedom to innovate on the assumption that everybody else will benefit. That's the trickle-down theory. And then there's the, the view that uh, the government needs to incentivize or de-incentivize, like tax break for green products and a tax on carbon so we can become sustainable. Um, and then there's, of course, the other extreme is that the government controls the economic system. Aristotle disagreed with that and he gave his reasons, but he also disagreed with um, an unlimited, unregulated economic sector. He thought there should be a very high inheritance tax because there should not be a class of people who inherit wealth without having proven themselves to be good at a job. You shouldn't just inherit wealth or privilege. You have to earn it. You have to show that you're good at exercising this position, this role in society. If you are virtuous and you do have a job that gets paid well, you will give the money back in a way that actually, again, promotes well-being. So, so legislation is important, and we argue a lot about how to create legislation that actually will create a middle class. Some of those arguments are better than others. We try to have research. And so we could have the best social situations ever because Aristotle didn't have access to research. He just had to argue more on principle that a certain constitution would tend toward creating a middle class or another one just by its structure. And he'd give some examples from history. But we can also add, you know, our social science research and um, get better at this. But the research itself is not going to create the desire of the people in charge to really care about flourishing. Um, the laws concerning the distribution of goods. All right, so people should pay taxes to provide for education. People are unequal in what they need. So right now we have this issue between about in order to have a middle class, what sort of opportunities for education should each citizen get? And different citizens need different kinds of opportunities. So everybody needs a high quality K through 12, um, especially K through, junior, through sixth grade or so is pretty standard. And then it will start to branch off and kids will gravitate toward math or humanities, English or whatever, but they should keep getting all of them. And then um, they can, right now, they're, I think the evidence is that to have a middle class, some kids should be opportunities to go to trade school. Some young people should have opportunities for community college. And then they would get some liberal arts, but also uh, a specialty, a certificate at the end of that. Some students would need a liberal arts undergraduate. And then they could get a good job after that. Uh, certain jobs just want that bachelor's degree. Other students have the desire, the ability, the kind of job they want requires a master's degree and then some of them terminal degrees, um, like my job required PhD. Um, but the government should provide the opportunities. And then if the, the students are raised well and they're encouraged to pick the thing they like to do, they can do, that contributes the most to society, they'll make good judgments about which possibilities they want to apply for. And then if, if their judgment is good, then the government should provide it. 
So of course, there's all the ways things can go wrong. And then there's discrimination based on class, race, gender. All of those things uh, need to be broken apart. You know, uh, a good uh, person who has the virtues, political virtues, will ignore gender, race, and class and focus on natural ability, motivation, um, and then provide the opportunities. Okay, so then the laws concerning the criminal justice system, punishing people. So we argue a lot about what sort of criminal laws we have. Some of the laws by, you know, just the laws itself, capital punishment, big arguments about whether that should even be possible based on does it promote flourishing? Um, I think the evidence is out that it doesn't. And it's really sort of institutionalized revenge. And the point of a, a system of the rule of law is that we get over revenge and we solve our problems through laws <laughs> instead. Um, anyway, there's disagreements about what laws there should be. Then there's disagreement about what the punishment should be and how much people should get punished, what kind of punishment. And always it should be with, the goal should not be taking revenge. The goal should be promoting flourishing. Um, then there's how to apply the laws to particular cases. This is what judges and juries do. Um, and right now, I mean, there's always been controversy about slaves, obviously. And previous, you know, released slaves, freed slaves, the whole fact that we had a legal uh, institutionalized slavery has led us to a very tainted legal system ever since, because that's an abomination in a country that wants to be some kind of a democracy. Um, and then how to enforce the laws, uh, the system of jails and prisons, is it punitive? Do people come out of there worse criminals than they were when they went in? And or does it is the goal to give them some job skills and to respect them, give them a sense of dignity so that when people do get out, they won't go back to their old neighborhoods, give them a new job, a new place to live, they can start over. In the US, we have a terrible system. We have way too many people in jails and prisons. The way we treat them is that they, the average prisoner returns, I think it's six times before they finally don't come back. That's ridiculous. Costs a lot of money. And I think it's because we have this punitive philosophy that the point is to punish rather than the point is to rehabilitate. So um, Aristotle would definitely be on the side of rehabilitation. <clears throat> <laughs> then we have the intellectual virtues, which are the ones associated with formal education. Now these, this is science, math, critical thinking, rhetoric, social science. It's STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. In uh, Now in our high-tech world, engineers have a whole lot of power <laughs> It's very interesting, you know, there was a time when religious leaders had a lot of power and they were the smartest person in town. And then there were political leaders and then there were um, corporate CEOs, but not many of them were engineers. And so I would say ever since Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, that era, which is my age, actually, my age is the beginning of a world run by engineers, <laughs> which is surprising to me. I didn't even know what an engineer was, but um, now in Aristotle's model, he says that the part of the psyche that's connected to the moral virtues is the part related to pleasure and pain. And you educate through habit, imitation, custom. The intellectual virtues are not naturally tied 
to that part of the psyche at all. I mean, in order to study science or math, you have to take pleasure in it. But it can be pleasure for the sake of money. It can be pleasure for the sake of power, for the sake of status, for the sake of... Um, it could be just idle curiosity, just uh, for the sake of hiding away from the rest of the world, just isolating yourself and playing video games or creating video games uh, just because that's what you're interested in. And then you can get a job and that's great. So you can be a very wicked person and be very smart. And the Apollo, the God of reason, is very, you know, he has all these intellectual skills. He is emotionally immature. He treats women uh, like nymphs, like sex objects. He takes revenge on them. I mean, he's immature. Let's leave it at that. And then um, he also is in, indifferent to justice. So he starts out in the war, Trojan War, on the side with the just cause. But they get so internally conflicted. This is not efficient. This is not a well-run operation. So he switches to the Troy that doesn't have the right cause. Like they're wrong. They shouldn't have kept Helen. But Hector runs a very tight organization. It's very unified. So the model there, I mean, it's very interesting to me because the pattern that Homer picked out is exactly what we're living with, is that we have Apollonian types of people, really good at Apollonian reasoning, but they don't care what kind of company they run. Like um, Mr. Musk, he's, you know, he is kind of off the wall, right? He'll do one thing, another thing, you never, on the one hand, he'll do electric vehicles. On the other hand, he'll hang out with um, Rupert Murdoch, the head of Fox News. And he doesn't really seem to care about manipulating public opinion in a way that could undermine democracy. Uh, so Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, again, social media or meta, whatever, people are telling him, you know, this stuff is doing harm to teenagers. And all he does is, I run a tight ship, I'm successful. His latest focus is to try to get four-year-olds addicted to phones, keep going deeper into the brainstem and keep going younger in order to keep have running a successful operation. Oh my goodness. And um, Bezos and Musk and these guys also tend to have reputations for not treating women very well for picking out, you know, sort of nymph types or else trading them in for a younger model every 10 or 15 years, right? That's what Mr. Um, Fox News, he traded in his wife. He has a second family and those kids are going to start fighting for the empire. <laughs> it's crazy, but it's interesting that they're following the same patterns as the god Apollo with all the same problems. Um, and I think because of our tradition in the Enlightenment, we really thought science and social science was going to save the world on their own without this training and wisdom. It wasn't taken seriously enough. So Aristotle that's another reason to keep Aristotle going, right? Is that that understanding that wisdom requires all of these virtues and the intellectual virtues have to be guided by people with practical wisdom, people with the moral virtues and the ability to make good judgments. So Sophia is the union of theoretical and practical wisdom. So another difference between ancient and moderns is Aristotle had this idea of a first mover. It's not theology. It's not the God of the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims. It's not 
it's uh, in Hinduism, there's Brahma. There is sort of an ultimate um, uh, whole, right? Brahma is the universe. Vishnu is the um, savior, the one who comes down and tries to get things going. And Shiva is the destroyer. Vishnu is the preserver. Um, and then with Buddhism, there's sort of a liberation. There is a point there where your mind is in touch with the universe. And so for Aristotle, there is this ultimate first principle. And so your goal is to be a microcosm in the macrocosm, that the universe has this ordering force that everything in the universe moves toward higher and higher levels of complexity. It's very creative in that sense, complexity, but within this context of order. So there's this ordering principle behind it. Everything in the biosphere has moved in, in the direction of higher and higher complexity. Now we are now, with our Apollonian reasoning, destroying the biosphere. So it gets harder and harder to predict how nature will try to heal its, herself. And Aristotle always talked about nature. Nature does nothing in vain. He's studying plants and animals. He thinks they're beautiful because he can see this force of nature, this adaptability, this way that species, um, uh, new species emerge relative to what's already there. It's just everything has a function and a purpose. He thinks it's very beautiful, which I do too. <laughs> but um, it's based on this view. And so your mind, your noose, there's a higher power your mind is focused on the fact that you are this creature is under able to understand patterns in a universe where they exist that's how you flourish and um also if you want to flourish you're also an animal and you have to make decisions very particular decisions in very particular moments related to very basic animalistic needs and drives. And then you have to try and get from that to your own flourishing, to social flourishing, to international flourishing, to flourishing over time from one generation to another to fit into the cosmos. So, I mean, it's complicated, but it's a different model than the mo modern model and it's important. So I want to, in the next lecture, I will show that ever since Einstein replaced Newtonian mechanics, this positing of some underlying force has reemerged. This means that our minds at all times are aware that we live in an order universe. We need to try and understand the underlying order. There's limits to what we should do. There's patterns in the way we make better and worse choices. And so that the tragedians, the artists, are always trying to help us recognize the patterns so that we can make wise decisions. We can make the best decisions in circumstances. So the goal is practical wisdom, to have your noose, your mind, making decisions so you live, you literally live the truth you're living a life that's a reflection of the universe. That's part of this natural drive for flourishing. The choices you make are choices that promote your flourishing, everybody else's flourishing. So you're, you're a healthy species in a certain kind of universe. So it requires excellence in the art of deliberation. So deliberation, the goal is to maximize flourishing. And it includes both sciences. It includes the sciences. You can't make a good decision unless you have experts in the field. You have all the scientific knowledge you need. But it's more than just science. Um, you have to gather everyone together. You have to figure out um, what the disagreements are and come to some agreement on why this would be best. You always have human flourishing the goal. The object of choice, when you're deliberating about it, you have to, what are the options that are possible? 
which is usually a long ways from world peace or something. Um, but people can make uh, can make false assumptions. Some somebody thinks I think it's possible to um, rehabilitate these prisoners. Someone else will say it's not possible. They're hardened criminals, right? So we have to, you know, what's the evidence? What do we know from the past? What's the what kind of character this person is based on? their history, whatever. So we do that, we do this kind of thing. Uh, we argue about what's possible. Other people will say um, that something is not possible that actually is possible, right? So sometimes people think something's possible that's not, that's too idealistic. Some people think uh, it's impossible, they're too cynical. And it's very hard. That's an art because not only does it involve research, you have to motivate and inspire people. So um, practical wisdom is you determine the best choice and then you have to figure out why you think it's best. And you also have to realize, well, what, what could be convincing? You have to be able to inspire everybody Who's um, who has to change in order to meet the goal. Because if it's a practical goal, then it involves a whole lot of people behaving a certain way. Um, so you have to be able to explain to people why that you decided that. And then you have to inspire them. And you have to lead. You have to lead by example. But you have to be give, have good compelling. You have to be good at speech making, at persuasion. Um, or you're not going to get there. So you could say, for example, in at our time, you know, taxing carbon is absolutely necessary for us to avoid climate disaster, but also compete with the Chinese for the next wave of economic domination. But people will not accept it, like they've been habituated to using carbon uh, to have a huge carbon footprint. Well, what are you going to do, right? The, all What all the science says is necessary is completely at odds with how people are habituated. And then you have a whole political party that's, whose political rhetoric is controlled by carbon, fossil fuel-based billionaires. So they're going to be using rhetoric to promote fossil fuels and to let people have their habits. So how do you do that? That's an art. That's not just science. Um, it Leadership, leadership requires a lot, but you definitely have to have a strong moral character to lead by example. Living and examine life. When you're constantly seeking to exercise as many virtues as possible, you have a difficult life. It's complicated, but it's flourishing. So you, a good person will seek out opportunities to accept, exercise these virtues. They will want to mediate quarrels. They will consider starting a new organization, adding to what already exists, being creative to make their societies better. And they keep uh, good citizens will keep their leaders accountable for how they use their power. They will stay informed about public life and they will learn from the successes and mistakes of others. So I, you know, one thing American citizens are supposed to do this to preserve our democracy, but they don't remember things like, why did you vote or why did your parents vote? for George W. Bush. What did they think he was gonna do? What did he do? Why did they want the Iraq war? We were told the war would pay for itself in six months. Now it's cost three, $4 trillion. Does anybody even know that? Or are they just on to the next social media post, right? You need to learn from the past, you know, reading history, but at least 
knowing your own history, your own personal history where this is who I voted for. This is why I thought they would be good. This is what I thought would happen. And then you have to go, did that happen? Was it reasonable for you to expect that? Or was that really stupid and you were manipulated? Citizens absolutely have to at least self-correct in their own personal voting history or behavior history. And I worry that Americans don't do that. And I, because I'm talking to Indonesians or I'm talking to anybody that wants to preserve a democracy, it's true for, for everyone listening to this video. Um, so what about Ponchasilla? And again, quick review, Ponchasilla has belief in God. Um, to be a good Indonesian citizen, you need to know Aristotle's virtues. I think to be a good American citizen, you do also. Uh, humanitarianism, that's a Greek view. Um, unity in diversity. So the Greek myths show that there's lots of different ways to, to contribute to the society. Diversity, pluralism is a principle of human culture and social and political life. Uh, we gain wisdom through deliberation and we have a social contract. The government owes people their basic needs and then they need to give back. So this hopefully after you've, now that we've gone through all these virtues, you realize that, well, yeah, if you if those were your virtues, it would be consistent with Panchasilla. All right, so what kind of curriculum would we want? Because Mr. Marif wants a curriculum, and I do too, right? A curriculum that educates the mind, the noose, um, this idea of the good that should guide the sciences, the STEM, um, and all the other intellectual virtues. And the mind requires personal, social, and political virtues before you can start deliberating. And then you need to get the expertise from either other people who have it or your own intellectual training. Um, so the, the humanities disciplines in the past um, people, they studied ideas about how to live. Theology is the idea of the highest good. Philosophy is the, what flourishing, what does it mean to be a flourishing human being? What is virtue? What is justice? Literature would be another way that poets, artists would try to convey, teach us how to live through telling these stories. History is another kind of storytelling to teach us patterns from the past. Who were the wise leaders and who made a mistake? And what were they thinking when they made the mistake? Or what were they thinking when they made these good choices? Um, so that was the tradition, is educating the mind and then using it to guide your other skills, other intellectual training that you get. Um, the humanities disciplines are in decline in the U.S. They're being replaced by STEM with the assumption that knowledge alone will enable us to flourish, to compete against the Chinese. But if it can be used for good or evil, we're not going to be able to do that. I mean, we really, if we want to compete with the Chinese, we have to go green. And there's nothing in the knowledge itself that gives you the value of going green. Um, all right, besides the curriculum, administrators, teachers, students should create a climate on campus where everyone is exercising virtues. There's social clubs. This is small liberal arts education. And I, ever since I left high school, my whole educational experience has been small liberal arts. First as an undergraduate, then in graduate school, which is very rare, both my master's and PhD were at a small liberal arts school. Then with the exception of my first year of teaching, all my other years of teaching were at small liberal arts schools. I taught at one 
one, two, three, four, about five small liberal arts schools all over the world. Um, two, one of them in Prague, one of them in Bangladesh, uh, but two of them in the Twin Cities in St. Paul and one of them in Arkansas. So this is the model that Plato, Plato's Academy was ki is kind of the cornerstone. I think it's the cornerstone, but I don't, there's so many things I don't know, could easily have been such an education in China or India long before the Greeks, you know, I, I would never say. All I know is in general, it's considered the cornerstone of the West. Even then you could have that Parmenides or people before Plato's time also had their schools and they taught practical wisdom, which is very possible because Parmenides gave the town that he was living in a constitution um, a set, because that was just part of what you do. So if you're a theoretical thinker, you also have practical wisdom, you get involved in political life, often as more of a leader, because you can provide that insight. Um, and you can deliberate well, you can listen to other people. But anyway, so I think the point here is that the philosophy behind liberal arts education and the virtues behind it, and it was designed to cultivate those virtues in that order of priority, is still very legitimate and very needed, even though the fact that most students and most professors spend all or most of their time in, in large research institutions, which are not designed to cultivate uh, the virtues and the character in relation to the intellectual virtues, it's still important, even though we don't have it structured that way. So we need to keep that in mind if we're gonna develop a curriculum. Um, in the USA and Europe, the public educational system has tended to avoid trying to educate children to be virtuous because that got tied with religion and religion is anti-science and all this stuff. So there was a history behind that. Also the history of colonialism is that, you know, we're wiser than you and therefore we can take the land of the Native Americans because they're so primitive. Um, and then religious education was considered indoctrination into exclusive religious dogmas that are anti-science, anti-intellectual. So, so, you know, how is public education going to educate for virtue? And I would say that Aristotle's model, considering he's the doc, he's the son of a doctor, it's a biological model. It could serve to do that. And our founding fathers recognized that. They just didn't think it was only Aristotle. They thought Confucius. And when I come to that section, I can show why that's true. But here's on the one hand, the general overall perception is that we tend to go here. And then on the other side, the traditional religious education system tend to be intolerant, anti-scientific and anti-social science. So this of course got worse during COVID. Um, although again, the news tends to cover the worst cases and you don't know what percentage of religious versus uh, secular institutions and educational institutions actually were pro-vaccine and anti-vaccine. It's just too much. You have to just recognize that there are these patterns and these stereotypes. And what's important is that you can use Aristotle's model if it's, it again, it needs to be tweaked and it needs to be adapted to fit today, but it can be. And why would we use it? Because it's systematic, whereas systems thinkers, um, I don't know of any that, that can discuss the virtues in this very systematic way. 
that leads to the need to integrate nature and culture. So I, it's the best model I know that ends up with integrating nature and culture because Aristotle's fundamental premise is people by nature desire to understand. They do that because the universe is understandable, which means we need, we shouldn't be destroying it and making it ununderstandable. That's suicidal, greed does that. So I think Aristotle's model can fit excellently with systems thinking, but you need some lectures, you need some tweaking, but it does work. And um, without that, we end up with all the mess that we tend to have, and it creates a culture war, and the rich end up getting richer, and the fossil fuel companies end up controlling our legal system, and it's not a good situation. So that would be why um, I am trying to promote this particular way of integrating. Um, and it's Aristotle with sustainability. It's Aristotle with Panchasila and Indonesia and Indonesia's contribution to global culture and sustainability. And that's where we're going, which I probably don't have to keep reminding my my listeners, but 